Unplugged In, President Joe Biden challenges world leaders on climate change with an ambitious goal for the United States. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. Reaching those goals relies on technologies that reduce emissions from cars and trucks. We want trucks to be green and we want them to do a lot of green miles per day. It is not just the air that needs to be clean. Solar and hydropower push the wheel that cleans the water. The trash wheels have picked up over 1,600 tons of trash and debris from the Baltimore Harbor uh, over the past seven years. The innovations already in use and those still to be developed unplugged in the climate change crisis. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C. President Joe Biden campaigned on a promise to make fighting climate change a central part of his presidency. In April, Biden convened world leaders in a virtual climate summit, setting a goal for the United States to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent by 2030. He also announced an international climate finance plan, this plan to help other countries fund climate-related programs and limit funding for fossil fuel projects. VOA Steve Barragona reports, the president's plan may get approval overseas, but faces challenges at home. On the last day of his summit, President Joe Biden sought to focus on the upside. Today's final session is not about the threat of climate change poses. It's about the opportunity that addressing climate change provides. It's an opportunity to create millions of good paying jobs around the world and innovate and innovative sectors. A video featured jobs in green industries and Biden got a boost from government and business leaders. Today, Denmark has more job in green energy than in fossils. And the private sector is on board. In Kenya, decentralized renewable energy companies are directly employing upwards of 10,000 formal workers, the majority of which are based in rural areas. This figure is comparable to the number employed by the Kenyan state utility. A few years ago, Vattenfall embarked on a journey with the goal to enable fossil-free living within one generation. This is not our sustainability strategy. It's our business strategy. Borg said the Swedish energy company is helping build the world's first fossil fuel-free steel plant, steel being one of the world's most energy-intensive industries. But others stressed that not everyone will come out ahead. Climate action has to put people at the center. The process of decarbonization will produce winners and losers. And governments must support proactively the regions and communities negatively affected. Labor union leaders said workers know change is coming, but they need to be at the table when planning what comes next. To stabilize the planet with net zero economies by 2050, we all know we have to get at least half of the job done by 2030. But it cannot repeat past transitions that have left workers and their communities stranded. The summit marked a U.S. return to climate leadership. Biden's pledge to cut emissions in half by 2030 is one of the world's most ambitious. But achieving it will not be easy, technically or politically. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell described it this way. This is quite a one-two punch. Toothless requests of our foreign adversaries and maximum pain for American citizens. Through his executive powers, Biden can get a lot done without Congress's help. It's going to be a lot harder. Um, and might not be possible to actually achieve the 50 to 52 percent reduction without the type of action from Congress that Biden has been calling for in something like the American Jobs Plan. Experts say Biden and other world leaders have work to do so they have something to deliver at November's United Nations conference in Glasgow. Steve Barragona, VOA News. Environmental experts say electric vehicles are a welcome step towards reducing pollution-related health challenges. But they also say emission standards and public transportation are still lacking in different parts of the world. An electrical taxi service from Finland is helping to reduce emissions in the notorious traffic in Nairobi, Kenya. 
That's where we find our VOA correspondent, Rude Elmendorf. Kenyan taxi driver Charles Kaloki says switching to an electric vehicle with Finnish ride hailing service Nopia Ride has been a boon for his pocketbook. Nopia Ride's parent company, Ecorent Oi, launched in Kenya in 2018 and has charging stations that give free power for their drivers. You can make better money out of this than going paying for fuel every other corner of this town that you visit. No PR ride, which means fast ride in Finnish, plans to expand its fleet of rented electric taxis from 30 to 100 by the end of this year. While the high cost of electric cars, about double that of fuel burners, remains a deterrent for buying, founder Jua Suo Janen says the demand is only growing. I think that uh, in the future it's not, not going to be only Nopia that is importing these electric cars. There will be other people that will be buying these cars and uh, more, more of them coming to the market. Nopia is competing against more than 11,000 fuel-driven taxis in Nairobi. The United Nations Environment Programme, UNEP, says most cars in Kenya used imports from Japan with high emission levels. The World Health Organization says automobile pollution causes at least 5,000 deaths per year in Kenya. We see increased cases of congestive obstructive uh, pulmonary diseases. We see many triggers of asthma, and all this can be alluded to uh, the, uh, the air pollution that is happening along uh, uh, our highways. Environmental experts say switching to electric taxis will help reduce air pollution. But Kenya also needs better public transport and a ban on high emission vehicles. They will then have to meet some minimum standard, which can already result in reductions of emissions depending on the pollutant between 70 and 90 percent per vehicle. Meanwhile, Nairobi will slowly see more electric cars plying its roads as chariots of change. Ruth Almendorf for VOA News, Nairobi. The package delivery industry has begun moving from diesel fuel to battery-operated electric vehicles. E-commerce giant Amazon is buying 100,000 electric vehicles from Rivian, a new U.S. manufacturer of electric vehicles. This year, Amazon is testing these custom vehicles in 16 cities. Its goal is converting to 100% renewable energy by 2030. FedEx plans to replace all of its pickup and delivery fleet with battery-powered vehicles by 2040. DHL says it plans to be at zero emissions by 2050. While electric cars are gaining popularity, there are challenges to full acceptance. Among those challenges, developing the technologies to allow longer drives on a single battery charge. Asher Bennett is the CEO of Teva Motors, his group is working to put more electric freight trucks on the roads. We spoke earlier about the technology and where the electric truck market is headed. The world of electric trucks, uh, painfully, is not where it should be. Um, we see a lot of versions of electric cars out there and just not enough electric trucks. Um, most of the electric trucks, by far, the options are much less than in cars. We design, develop, um, battery electric trucks so you charge them at night uh, at your depot usually and hopefully run all day and we also offer uh, the same trucks with a range extension option we think it's a very very important option the thing with trucks we have to understand is trucks are out there driving eight nine hours a day unlike cars that the average is one and a half hours a day and we believe we need different solutions for trucks than for our cars. Is the battery that we see in electric cars in, here in the United States, is that, and the technology, is that the same technology you have uh, at Teva in the, in the trucks? Is, that the, is it the same battery? Well, we use uh, lithium ions. We make our own battery packs and battery management system. That's the brains of the battery. Uh, we purchase cells from cell, big cell makers. We tend to use a chemistry called lithium iron phosphate, but it's just one of the lithium chemistries. Um, we see sometimes even Tesla is 
using it in some of its vehicles. It it is less energy dense than the other chemistries, so you need it weighs a little bit more for the same amount of energy, but it has a lot of other advantages, um, like a longer life cycle and a bit of a lower cost. But th there are different uh, lithium ion chemistries out there. We're open to using different ones for different needs because we make our own battery packs, we can adapt. So um, what's great about lithium ion batteries, uh, and I've been involved with lithium ion batteries for over uh, developing and building them for over a decade, is they're getting better and better in both uh, energy density. So the amount of energy in a given weight or volume, and also more importantly, the cost is coming down. I mean, about a decade ago, it was like a thousand dollars per kilowatt hour for a battery at, at the pack level, and now it's approaching one hundred and fifty dollars, and it's getting better. But it's not Moore's law. It's not the uh, you know tripling and quadrupling in short uh, in, in just a few years. So we're getting more and more energy into the same volume and weight, but it's not software or chips. It's something that it's electrochemistry. So we're improving. The issue is, if we think about trucks, is you want to get more and more range on that truck. So there's always the option of putting more and more battery on a truck. But at one point, all that extra battery is a lot of weight that you're carrying around. It's expensive. It's getting much better, but it's still expensive. And that limits you in the payload. It starts to be too much on the cost wise. And we have to remember one more thing. You can put a lot of battery on a truck, but you still have to charge that battery. And chargers are not as fast as we would want, as powerful as we want. And they're not ubiquitous at every street corner just yet. And let's talk one thing about trucks. When you're driving your Tesla, you might at one point say the state of charge of your battery is going low and start thinking about where I will, you will go to charge your, your car. But uh, in most cases, trucks are not going to stop in the middle of a delivery day, look for a charger, hope it's available, hope it's working, and then stop for half an hour or two hours, depending to charge. It's not the way trucks are used. So you need to, basically, you need a solution that when you send a truck out in the morning, it will come back no matter what. What's sort of the biggest technological hurdle that, that everybody's having the most trouble overcoming with electric vehicles? It's the total, getting the total solution and ecosystem together to work. So, um, you can have an electric car, but if you don't have a dedicated parking space wherever you live and you can't set up your own charger, you might be limited in being able to use that car. Um, and, and having to depend on public charging is difficult. It, it's about getting the ability to get that energy into the vehicle and getting it dependent, dependently and cost effectively. Um, I've seen very fast, high powerful chargers out there, and that's great, and it's really advancing the world of electric vehicles. But right now, the cost of those chargers is very high, um, often more than the cost, could be higher than the cost of the vehicle itself. And even then, it's about getting the power to the charger. The grid today can't always uh, allow very high power or a lot of it uh, at the same location. If you're thinking about trucks, if you're putting very large batteries into trucks and you want dozens of trucks to simultaneously charge and charge fast, you're talking many megawatts of power. And that is not something that is easily available at many locations. And remember, you want to have the ability to charge everywhere you need it. Otherwise, you can't depend on it. Um, and the way we look at it at Teva, look, if there's government support, why not use it? But we have to focus on a product that long term customers will buy because it gets the job done on range wise and saves them money with or without the government support. Um, that's more important. That's the best way to get a lot of trucks to be green. We want trucks to be green and what we want them to do a lot of my green miles per day. We don't want them doing short routes because that sort of defeats the whole purpose. While we can see the dark smoke coming out of tailpipes and smokestacks, 
the effects of that pollution goes largely unseen. This is not so for those whose livelihoods depend on the land and the sea. More now from VOA's Araj Arabasadi. Scientists point to climate change as the reason for the increase in the number of extreme weather events. NASA's senior climate advisor Gavin Schmidt says the problem starts with rising temperatures. As the planet warms, uh, the ocean absorbs that heat and that's causing the ocean to expand. So that fills uh, the basins uh, more and more. But of course, as we're warming, we're also melting ice. We're melting ice uh, in, in mountain areas, uh, glaciers are, are retreating. All of that water is effectively ending up in the ocean. Schmidt says the planet's rising temperatures lead to drier land, which in turn leads to wildfires like this one in Mexico. Edgar Godoy oversees Mexico for the Rainforest Alliance, a nonprofit group working to protect nature while helping farmers. He says fires, floods, and melting glaciers have become routine. And every year in, in, in Mexico, as I, I think in, in, in the whole world, we are always saying, oh, this was the hottest year in the last five years. But it's happening year after year after year. So this is something that is, it is, it is not, not, not changing, no? About one-third of Mexico City's 20 million residents is affected by water shortages. Under near-constant threat of drought, Godoy says farmers can't depend on their crops alone. As they don't, they don't, they don't have like the, the income that they were expecting from, from uh, a specific crop, maybe they will need to go to the forest or, 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 or the rainforest and clear cut, clear cut it. To, to, to sell some wood or some other um, things that are having impact on deforestation or degradation of, of forest and rainforest. As trees disappear from clear cutting and their roots no longer hold dirt in place, landslides and flooding increase. Intan Fadinatri of the Rainforest Alliance in Indonesia says these natural disasters hit hardest those who make a living off the land. The agriculture rural uh, community, uh, you know, is you know, is always like uh, they are in a very remote area, and by having landslide, you know, damaging the the infrastructure, so they are even remote than than before, uh, isolated. Fardinatri says the erratic weather patterns have cut Indonesia's coffee production in half, and the country's cocoa and coffee farmers have watched their livelihoods shrink when they were young uh, it, it 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 wasn't like this and, and now uh, the soil getting uh, exhausted uh, soil is dry she says the clash between economic development and protecting the environment may make those taken for granted staples increasingly unsustainable to grow arash arabasadi voa news according to the natural resources defense fund each year, more than 300 million tons of plastic is produced worldwide. Half of that is for single-use items like straws, eating utensils, and bags. A year ago, Senegal banned most single-use plastics, but enforcement has been a challenge. For Earth Day in April, surfers, scuba divers, and activists in Senegal went underwater to set an example. Anika Hammerschlag reports from Dakar. From bottles to bags to food wrappers and fishing nets, plastic waste is piling up on Senegal's beaches, harming the environment that people and animals depend on. Toxic chemicals from plastic leach into the water and can build up in fish, which are a vital part of the Senegalese diet. Senegal's Ministry of Public Health notes links between plastic pollution and infertility, heart disease, cancer, and other health problems. All of these products that are used by the industry can be dangerous, and in terms of pollution, they can attack all of our organs, but equally those of animals. But especially as you have seen in all these documentaries and studies, it impacts marine life. The Senegalese government passed a law in 2015 banning single-use plastics, but little changed. The law was rescinded to make way for new legislation that specifically targeted plastic cups, straws, plates, bags, and bottles. It went into effect in 2020, but it's still rarely enforced. 
Et il n'y a pas forcément suffisamment d'informations. There is not necessarily enough information. The population, the users, are not well enough informed about the existence of this law and its different statutes. To mark the anniversary of last year's ban and this year's Earth Day, Dakar's Barracuda Scuba Diving Club and activists held a coastal cleanup. Clean Senegal's Khadim Jouf wore a plastic costume while sorting the waste to underscore the need to make an impact. Je crois que on peut le faire. I think we can do it, us, the citizens of the world. I don't just mean the citizens of Senegal, but the citizens of the world. Everyone must protect their environment. That's what we must do. Until then, Joff and other activists say they will continue to campaign for a cleaner Senegal. Annika Hammerschlag for VOA News, Dakar, Senegal. In the mid-Atlantic city of Baltimore, Maryland, Solar-powered water wheels are pulling piles of trash from the city's waterways. Adam Lindquist works with the Baltimore Waterfront Partnership. That is one of several groups promoting water health education. I asked him how the trash wheels work to keep the city's waterways clean. We run a project called Mr. Trash Wheel, which is actually the world's first sustainably powered trash interceptor. It floats at the end of a river and uses solar and hydropower to pick up trash, mostly plastic, out of the water uh, before it can reach the Baltimore Harbor or the Chesapeake Bay. All right, when you say sustainable, you mentioned the sol solar and, and uh, the water power. So you're not, you're not using a gasoline engine to put more stuff in the water, right? Uh, cor correct, right. We, we thought it was really important that if we're going to be cleaning up the harbor that we not make pollution while we're doing that. Right. Where's this trash coming from that you're collecting? So a lot of people think that it's uh, people throwing their trash into the water, but that's not actually the case. Um, the trash in the Baltimore Harbor comes from throughout the city because every time litter goes down a storm drain, it goes into our streams and harbor. It doesn't get filtered out by some magical filtration plant. So uh, so when you when you you collect it at the river entering into the harbor, I mean, where are these collection points? Sure. We collect. Um, so trash wheels are at the end of a river or stream or stormwater outfall. Uh, they don't move around. I often say they're not Roombas. Uh, they don't go around looking for trash. They sit at the end of the stream and wait for the trash to come to them. So we pick up about 90% of our trash when it's raining because that's when stormwater is carrying trash into our drains and into our streams and harbor. How many of these do you have? So we have three in Baltimore right now, but we're actually about to install our fourth uh, in a matter of weeks. So we will soon have four trash interceptors here. Are these trash interceptors, though, in other parts of the United States? We have, we've got the same problem in other harbors in the United States and also around the world. Uh, absolutely. You know, Mr. Trash Wheel started here in Baltimore, was invented in Baltimore. Um, but I get calls weekly from cities around the world interested in installing this technology. And in fact, the company that builds them is already working in Panama City, Panama, to install a trash wheel there. How much do they cost? If I, wanted to, if I wanted to buy one, if I had a river and I wanted to clean up, well, how much would I have to pay? Well, you know, the real question is how much is it going to cost to dispose of the trash every year? Because it's easy to get enough money to build a trash wheel, but to find an entity who's going to own and operate it for the duration of its life is a lot more challenging. So a trash wheel might cost you know, between half a million and a million dollars. Uh, but the bigger, the harder question is who's going to pay for the like $100,000 of trash you have to dispose of? Because once you pick up the trash out of the water, you own it. You've got, to, uh, you've got to take it away to um, some sort of disposal facility, uh, and then there are tipping fees and disposal fees related to that. So, you know, that's the real cost um, that a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people think you just put a trash wheel in the river and you're done. You can move on. Uh, but really, you need to figure out how to pay for the ongoing operation and maintenance. I take it that it's only, you're only picking up the floating trash. Am I correct? That is correct. Uh, anything that floats, we pick it up. Um, if it's neutrally buoyant, like a plastic bag, for example, we might capture it. Uh, trash is funneled to the front of the device using two containment booms, and those booms have a two-foot skirt beneath them. So we catch whatever's in the first two feet of the water column, but something that's floating lower down might get past us. Have you have some measure of how Mr. Trash Wheel has done? I mean, is there some sort of measurement that you give me, like how much trash you've taken out or the, the oh, quality of the harbor? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Mr. Trashville's made a huge difference. Um, after a large storm event, we picked up 15 dumpsters full of trash 
uh, just from one storm. So if Mr. Trash Wheel wasn't there, all of that trash would be floating around the harbor and going out into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, combined, the trash wheels have picked up over 1,600 tons of trash and debris from the Baltimore Harbor uh, over the past seven years. To put that in perspective, that's about 13 million cigarette butts, um, over a million foam containers, and over a million plastic bottles. What's the biggest offender? Plastic bottles? Is that what you see most of? Uh, I would say that foam containers used to be our biggest offender. Uh, foam is a real problem because it, you know, it doesn't break down. It breaks up into these smaller and smaller pieces, making it harder and harder to collect. Um, but really cool story about Mr. Trash Wheel, and I think a really important part of what we're doing in Baltimore is that we use our data and our photos to actually pass legislation. So we helped Maryland become the first state in the country to ban foam containers statewide. All right, what's, what's the next project, or is this, is, are you going to expand on this one? Well, we're going to be installing this new trash wheel, which we call Gwenda, the Good Wheel of the West, um, in a couple weeks. And Gwenda will actually be the largest trash wheel we've ever installed. So we're really excited because she should pick up more trash than the other three trash wheels combined. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And since I live near the Baltimore Harbor within 60 miles, uh, you know, I, I, see, I see the work that it is doing and really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Climate change impact is also being carefully watched at the lowest point in the world, the Dead Sea. Scientists are concerned the Dead Sea is disappearing and along with it, a unique environment. Linda Gradstein reports from the Dead Sea. Jake Benzakin steers his small boat toward a strange salt formation poking through the surface of the Dead Sea. Until recently, these formations were all underwater, but the sea is shrinking fast. He believes that the unique environment of the Dead Sea, the lowest place on Earth, must be preserved. I think that the Dead Sea is an, is, belongs to the world. You know, I think it, it's, it, it's one of the, it's the only place in the world that is the Dead Sea. There is nothing like it. And yeah, I think, yeah, we should save it. The shrinking Dead Sea has been documented for years by the Dead Sea Revival Project. The Dead Sea is actually right now in the lowest in recorded history. We're losing up to 600 Olympic pools per day. And we're trying to do anything we can to have a vision to restore the historical flow in order to try saving the Dead Sea in any way as possible. The Dead Sea's main source of water is the Jordan River but its flow has been drastically reduced by rain and water shortages in this desert region. Climate change has also led to the sudden appearance of over 6,000 huge and dangerous sinkholes in the landscape, devastating the tourist industry in the area. Some Israeli environmental artists are trying to raise awareness of the shrinking Dead Sea and the dangerous sinkholes using dance and environmental art installations. This whole area also has a prophecy of what's gonna happen in the world if we are not going to take care of uh, our mother, mother nature. Dead Sea climate therapy clinics have treated thousands of patients suffering from skin diseases and breathing problems. They utilize the region's unique environmental conditions, including increased oxygen levels, UVA radiation, and mineral-laden water. Now a new study shows that the Dead Sea environment may benefit COVID patients as well. It is the first time that we can see that UVA radiation can be helpful for patients with COVID-19. In the recent study, we understood that UVA radiation can prevent death from COVID-19. Environmentalists here say there are many reasons to save the Dead Sea and hope this research will raise awareness of what needs to be done to stop the Dead Sea from shrinking even more. Linda Gradstein for VOA News at the Dead Sea. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you to my guest, Teva Motors founder and CEO Asher Bennett and environmental advocate Adam Lindquist. And stay up to date on the latest news at voanews.com and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.